so well welcome everybody well i guess you know like most of you know my name is Elisa Chu. I'm the founder and CEO of Anchor Taiwan. We have been an ecosystem partner, um, sorry, builder since 2017, and essentially with this huge passion to bring the world to Taiwan through entrepreneurship. And I guess we essentially believe that community and venture capital are very important and powerful tools for corporate startups and investors to really kind of like leverage the cutting edge technology and innovation. And we started this whole woman in venture series about two years ago. And the idea is that we really believe that by leveraging, you know, like different talents, different um, diversity, we are able to really kind of like have different investment opportunities and encourage more women to be this part of the ecosystem. So, so far we have hosted a lot of brilliant investors and mentors such as, you know, like um, the partners from Y Combinator, um, uh, Foundation Capital, Intel Capital, and so on and so forth. So really thank you for joining us for our 11th Women in Venture Roundtable. And you know, like a bit of history, basically for us, uh, I remember that for the first nine sessions, it's pretty much just all volunteer work, um, a lot of time and effort and love that went into this whole series. And we have brought together uh, so far about 100 investors with this session. And I think a lot of you have been to our other sessions before, but we also have seen, you know, are seeing some new lovely faces. And I remember at the end of our nice session, Someone who is also with us here in the room actually walked into the session and he was like, hey, Lisa, you know, like me and my organization would love to support this very important mission. And, you know, like, uh, can we do that? So with that, SEME, S-E-M-E, -E, became our first institutional supporter for our 10th Women in Venture events, uh, our milestone events that a lot of you were a part of last December. And that support carry into this year and we're really hoping to do more for, you know, like in the future. So I think before we formally started, I would like to invite Terry Tao, the president of Semi Taiwan and the global CMO to quickly say hi to us. And he's also the very few, one of the handful men in our room here tonight. So Terry, over to you. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, of course, most of you are ladies. Yeah, I think it is my greatest honor to be part of the Anchor Taiwan Roundtable event today. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, uh, SEMI, uh, we are a global uh, industry association uh, focusing the microelectronic and the semiconductor uh, industry for more than 50 years. Uh, our goal is to facilitate the high day industry grow with prosperity. Uh, recently, we also offer several initiatives as a priority, such as uh, grouping the mature uh, high-tech company corporate VC uh, to nourish the new startup company. Uh, we also advocate a diversity inclusion program, uh, especially like a woman in tech or a woman in uh, tech venture. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we got a chance to know uh, Anka Lisa. We feel that uh, she is a very unique person and is very passionate about several initiatives which we feel is a perfectly match uh, with our organization goal. So that's why we're here today uh, to show our support to the Women in Venture and also uh, show the recognition and the support to Elisa too. Yeah, uh, it's a pretty that I have to leave uh, around nine before the uh, end of the uh, event because we have a three day uh, global meeting we are beginning from late of today. Uh, however, my team member uh, Joanne and uh, Erica will be uh, here uh, for answer the other quest question or the help uh, if you need it. So I sincerely wish all of you can get out of the inspiration, collaboration, especially the friendship uh, after this roundtable. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Terry. It's always great to have you around. Thank you so much for, for your ongoing support. Uh, if you know Terry, um, you know, like Semi is really a very, very important platform, especially with semiconductor industry being such a backbone of Taiwan's economy. So thank you so much, Terry, for joining us out of your super, super busy schedule. So I guess, you know, like um, now, just very quickly, a few housekeeping items. First, we're going to do this 
fireside chat with Melody. I know a lot of you are really looking forward to that. And afterwards, we're going to have a Q&A, ask me anything session for Melody. So get your questions ready. We encourage you to, you know, like during the session, feel free to type them out in the chat so that we can answer them timely. Or if you want to do it in the end, you know, like turn on your webcam so that, you know, Melody will also get to know you as well. At the end, as usual, we're going to go through the room so that each and every one of you will get to know each other. Um, the goal is also for you to understand each other's investment thesis, focuses, check size, and so on and so forth. So in the future, you can share deal flow, co-invest, do, 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 do due diligence together, and, and so on and so forth. So that's sort of like what's going to happen today. So I guess without further ado, now I am going to get Melody. Hey, are you ready? You Yes. How, how is everything in New York this morning? It's good. It's uh, it's 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 a uh, pretty mild weather considering what's going on in Taipei. I'm sure it's it's much hotter there. Um, but yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to roll. Um, I'm drinking coffee because it's eight o'clock in the morning here. So, um, great to great to be here and thanks, Ilus, uh, for uh, for having me. Um, it's a very interesting and and, and exciting to uh, participate in something like this and and. You know, do what I can to be helpful to the uh, ecosystem in Taiwan. So, glad thank to be you. Here. Yeah, thank you for joining us early morning from New York. And I was obviously very happy to meet you through one of our previous speakers, uh, Morgan Lai. Mm -hmm. And obviously, for you, you know, very impressive background: Harvard MBA, did M and A before investment banking, and so on and so forth. And a rising star, I guess, as a product manager, all the way to um, the head of product at Blue Apron. And, you know, like, I, I was actually very interested because, you know, like now as an investor at NextView Ventures, as a partner over there, you know, like I later found out that we actually share a lot of similar backgrounds in a sense that mm -hmm. you actually went through public school all the way through mm -hmm. high school and mm -hmm. then went to the States for college and, you know, like uh, master's. So very different from the typical ABC American, Chinese mm -hmm. American type of background, but you mm -hmm. managed to build your career I would say in the mainstream US markets. Mm -hmm. So I guess before we start, I would love to start from unpacking your upbringing a little bit mm -hmm. in a sense that, you know, along your journey, what, you know, as a kid, as a child, educated mostly <laughs> in Taiwan, and because I, I suffer from this sometimes, uh, I'm curious in terms of what you had to learn or rather unlearn along mm -hmm. the way throughout this journey, you know, mm -hmm. like so far with yeah. what you're doing at the moment. Yeah, I, I wish I have the magic answer. Then I would quit this job and write a book and just just speak. Right now, uh, um, joking aside, I say that uh, as you said, you know, I just I grew up kind of in an average middle 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 class family in in Taipei and went to just like generic public schools. Um, I grew up in in Tianmu, so I actually was very close to. TAS, but uh, you know, this is more of like a neighbor as opposed to literally five minutes away from TAS, Taipei American School. But I went to all public schools and local local middle schools and high school. I actually have a classmate in the participant. She's both my middle school and high school classmates. So she'll probably tell you I was pretty ordinary uh, or very, 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 very uh, generic, uh, uh, you know, upon high school graduation. And I would say that um, I really appreciate. So one thing is like, I think, you know, reflecting back when I was in high school and probably middle school, I was probably pretty shy. Um, I classify myself as probably an extreme extrovert now, but I probably was not like that if my memory served me correctly. Um, so that, that's pretty interesting. So I basically what happened to me was that uh, my parents both came to the States for, for master degrees and my dad was here for a PhD as well. So they had a little bit of background of like, oh, this is how studying in the U.S looks like. And when I got tested into uh, Beinu, uh, he was like, oh, do you want to go to go to go to go to the States for high school? I was like, what are you talking about? I just like study my ass off to get into the school. Of course, I want to like stay here for high school. Like, I don't want to go to the States for high school. He's like, oh, maybe you should go there for college. And literally the thought was just like, oh, maybe I would, you know, the concept at the time was like, oh, eventually I'll come here for for advanced degree and master. So maybe I come here a couple of years earlier and get better at English. So this thought was as simple as that. And I basically got dropped into, I went to University of Virginia. And when I got to the University of Virginia, half of my classmates like, where is Virginia? And 
I mean, UVA is a very solid and very good public school in in this in, in the U.S., but uh, it's not like mainstream West Coast um, you know schools that a lot of Taiwanese kids go to. And so I basically got dropped into the middle of nowhere in the South, and that was that was pretty interesting. So I think the things that I have to learn once I got there, I I quickly realized that um, I had to be more outspoken and. You know, I went to the undergrad business program. So the undergrad business program at UVA, uh, which is shorthand for University of Virginia, at UVA is a two-year program. So you do two years of liberal arts study. So whatever, econ, econ class, sociology, psychology, I took a lot of psychology classes. And then you do two years of business. Um, so, and then the business class is actually very similar to, they use case methods. So it's very similar to HBS, which I eventually went to. So they like I put you in a classroom and then like force you to read cases and participate. And half your grade comes from participation. So by that time, I was an international student and I feel like my full-time job is to like, the only thing I can control is to get good grades. I mean, it sounds very generic and very like Asian student, right? You just like get good grades. But I was like, you know, this is the one thing I can control. And then I have certain things that I had in mind from a professional perspective. And at the time I wanted to invest in banking coming out of school. So I was like, okay, the only thing I can control, the first thing I can control is good grades, but that requires me to actually speak in class. And in order to speak in class, my English has to be pretty good. So I really forced myself to uh, kind of be more outspoken and blend in, so to speak, in a way that like, I was very conscious of uh, making American friends, even though my closest friends from college days are still you know, international student, my, my, my very best friend who I still talked to many years later, she grew up in Shenzhen. So she's also an international student. And we obviously bought it right away, but we're both very like single-minded to like want to be able to uh, survive in this, this country, so to speak. Uh, so we're, we're, we're kind of like partners in, in a lot of the stuff that we did. And I think that was, you know, I remember I would like drag people who are older than me, like Xue Jie, Xue Zhang to like do practice interviews. And I was, a, I think that really helped a lot. I just like put myself out there and, and really like um, overcome it. American kids are pretty lazy, so they don't really study that hard. So like you can actually, that is like fairly easy to, to kind of overcome. But the harder thing is, you know, being able to socialize, like once you get into an internship environment and it's not just about like you have good grades and stuff. You, it's, so that was like a really, honestly, a really tough challenge and transition because I mean, I didn't, I didn't go to a school that has, predominantly English speaking environment. So I, the one thing, I mean, I, a lot of this is like luck too. Um, I had freshman dorm roommates who were kind of like took me under their wings and tolerate me for like really awkward English at first and would read my essays. One of them was an English major. She would like read my essays and be like, I know this is what you're trying to say, but people don't really use these words and, and like help me out like that. And, you know, drove me to grocery store. So like all that stuff, I think was very, very helpful. Uh, but I, I think the biggest change was probably, um, you know, I think college is a time like you, 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 you change as a personality. Um, and I think that that because of my, I guess my desire and drive to, to kind of be successful, quote unquote, like in this kind of career environment post-graduation, I just kind of like forced myself to do stuff that in, initially was unnatural and then eventually became pretty natural. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing, uh, kind of transitioning from from growing up in Taiwan. Um, yeah, I would say. Yeah, well, I think being more outspoken, definitely, I think now you reminded me back then, I also faced similar challenges as well. And in the beginning, it was actually really, really tough because, you know, we had to force ourselves and even with broken English to really speak. Otherwise, you know, all of a sudden you're one of your top mark is only right. 50 percent or 80 percent of, right. you know, like whatever the participation mark that you couldn't get. So that's, right. that's very interesting. And I think a lot of people who eventually break into the mainstream, quote unquote, in the States probably all went through that similar sort of like yeah. journey. Yeah. And I think, you know, like for you, initially you really set your mind with this like investment banking and, you know, like um, eventually with Harvard MBA and then you decided to join a startup. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, you know, like with Blue Apron, and I, I suppose, I suppose uh, most mm -hmm. people in this room probably know about Blue Aprons, but you know, maybe just very quickly. Well, I guess 
I wish that exists now in Taiwan, given that I have been cooking you know, at home for like you guys a month all locked now. Up. Yeah. yeah, and I'm running out of ideas. And I think, you know, if Blue Apron were to exist here, I would be able to have a lot more fun, I guess, cooking yeah, these yeah, days. Yeah, uh, obviously, yeah. that's not here yet. Maybe, you know, I don't yeah. know whether they have yeah. plan to be here. But, you know, just kind of like, I'm, I'm curious at the time, what made you make that decision in terms of, because, you know, for a lot of Asian kids, they want the brand name. They want the big shiny yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of like logo yeah. or, or yeah. title. What did you decide? Yeah. Why did you decide to join, Blue Apron, especially yeah. when you were so small? You were the first uh, product hire back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so my first job out of college was in investment banking. Um, my second job was in venture. So I was very lucky to um, work at a corporate venture team, uh, Time Warner at the time. Time Warner doesn't exist anymore. What happens? They sold to AOL, became Warner Media. Discovery just dies by Warner Media. So sadly, but Time Warner was a thirty billion dollar. Uh, media giant, right? They own TNT, TBS, CNN, one of the brothers, blah, blah, blah. Um, so Time Warner at the time had a corporate venture arm, $25 million outlay of year, uh, Series A, Series B style, digital media investments, um, a very professional team. So it's completely separate from the MA team. So that was a, I, was a, I was basically, there are three partner level folks and two associates. I was one of the two associates for about two years. And that kind of got me a taste of early stage. Like, both from the investor perspective as opposed to like, as well as like the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial environment. And this is in New York at the time. So this is about a decade ago and New York, the early stage ecosystem was less developed, although there was already booming. So that was a very interesting, you know, kind of understanding kind of the risk spectrum and, and, and how um, the culture of entrepreneurship. So I, 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 I pretty much enjoyed that. And then I went to business school, um, without going to kind of too much detail, I it, basically two weeks after I got there, I start working on my own startup. And how that happened was I was on the investor side. So I was just sitting at the other side of the table evaluating ideas all day. And then I got to school. This is back then, um, Eric Reese uh, and, and, and that crew just started this concept of lean startup. So minimum viable product, this was the concept that was just getting popular at the time. So you're thinking of like customer development, v1 mvp putting stuff out there and i had this idea and i you know as a as a business person you like analyze it you're like market size this and that you talk to a lot of people talk to your classmates and at some point you're like okay i have to build it see people pay for it because otherwise you never know so that was like okay well i'm a student now i don't have to quit my job even though it is really busy being a full-time mba student at Harvard, they actually are kind of take, they take themselves pretty seriously. So you can just skip class all day. And so you, you so this is that, but I was like, okay, this is, I can have used the spare time to try this venture. So I went down the rabbit hole because he became a founder and went through the founder journey, probably like a very, very early stage. So I had like that level of exposure. Don't sort of show that the company didn't work out. And coming out of school, I was pretty set on, okay, I want to become a product manager because when I was a founder, I didn't know how to build software. I didn't have a computer science degree. I didn't know how, what it meant to like shape a digital experience. And I feel like if I have a career in technology, whether it's on the investing side or on the operating side, this concept and the capacity to really shape how software interacts is really important skill. So then I decided that, okay, you know, I, I only want to work at a startup, how this came to my realization at HBS, many, many companies come recruit, including companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, and then the, your, your McKinsey, Bank, BCG, and other larger companies. So I never done campus recruiting. I never interview on campus. There's one information session from Amazon. So they do these information sessions. Like they, you know, they get a classroom and they fill people up and like, oh, here's what Amazon does. And there's the stuff that we have, people we hire. I went in. I could not stand for 30 minutes. I just got out. I was like, this is so boring. I cannot do this big company thing. I need to work at a startup. So that's basically kind of how I like, I never interviewed with anyone. I don't even know how campus recruiting actually works. And so that 30 minute session just was like, I, I can't deal with this. So the way I think about risk is, which by the way, is not how most of my business school classmates think about risk. HPS is very expensive. It's like 150 grand a year, US dollars, something like that. Not including travel and lodging. So I don't even know how much I spent. I was fortunate enough to have worked at investment banking to be able to pay for it without student debt. 
which is very fortunate. I understand not everybody's financial situation is the same. And the way I think about it is, okay, the reason I spend so much money is so that I can buy an insurance policy against my career. So if I really needed a job, I will be able to get a job that pays. If I really like need to pay rent and whatever. So I should take as much risk as I want because otherwise, why am I paying for this? <laughs> I, well, you know, I shouldn't really pay for this. I should just not do that. And so that gave, that framework, the other way I think about it in terms of how much money I make in my late twenties, early thirties is that I have like, I basically, by going to business school, I basically my cash account other than the retirement savings got wiped out. And I was like, it's okay. I'm tw late 20 something, like thing, money, you can make money later. And, and so like, I just feel like that was kind of my framework and I got really comfortable with it. And then, so my first job out of business school actually was at another startup called Fab as a product manager. So that was my first product job that gave me a break to then get, got hired by Blue Apron. And you know, quickly answer your question on Blue Apron was a 20 person company, 18 months old, younger than Fab. Fab had raised like $300 million by the time I joined and then went bust. This is a whole separate story. Um, but Blue Apron, I had conviction as a customer. I had been a customer actually. And then I was analyzing like a venture investor. I was like, your margin must suck. I've done an e-commerce business. Fulfillment is so complicated. Da, 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 da. And then I went in to talk to the team and I was like, oh, you guys actually have your stuff together. And this is actually very interesting. This company was growing for, for, for context, 18 months old, had product market fit right out of the gate. We're doing 15. So at the time I interviewed in December, two days before Christmas in 2013, they're like, oh, this month we're going to do $30 million run rate, US dollar run rate. In January, we're going to do $40 million run rate. In February, we're going to do $50 million run rate by end of 2014 calendar year, we're going to do a hundred million dollar run rate. I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. This guy, CEO, he was a venture capitalist as well. That's how we met. And that's how he found me. And I was like, yeah, whatever. You're just bluffing. And I got there. <laughs> and actually, that's actually what happened. This company grew 3X in like 12 months. It's insane. And it barely had marketing budget. They just start doing marketing. This is a consumer business. Um, and I was there for three and a half years. And by the time I left, we went public and you know what happened with the business is that they're one of the early entries in this this industry called meal kit so they're dominating for the first five years and i was fortunate to be part of that growth phase um, with my tenure and uh, when i left they got too close to a billion dollar run rate the business has since contracted because there are a lot of competition um and and this you know kind of talks about barriers of entry and stuff like that and there's also the execution mistakes of the business but nonetheless the business probably grew 25x during my tenure there i mean obviously not my own doing but you know there was a very 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 interesting learning experience to be able to see that and help build teams uh during that phase then i guess you know like people from the audience including myself probably are all we're all thinking well first of all i was like I was quickly looking through the list and thank God we don't have anything from Amazon. So, <laughs> and, and I think when you were describing this like crazy growth at Blue Apron, I think a lot of people were probably wondering, well, one, what's the secret sauce? Like, especially you as an insider, what did you see that they did right? That people, especially, I guess, you know, like startup founders from Taiwan and other parts of the world can learn from. And I'm sure it's probably not just one thing, but you know, like if you were to kind of like summarize that a little bit or like unique things that you see that they done, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think another thing is probably also, I'm always very curious because, you know, product manager, this role, we could kind of like imagine what that is like. And I guess before you got into that, you kind of feel like, oh my God, like, how do I actually do that? And you have been through that journey. So as a product person, if you were to give an advice to, let's say a non-product founder mm -hmm. or investor, what what would you like to tell them? You know, like you as someone who's been through the training and experience, what is one yeah. thing that you would you would want to tell them? Yeah, so two different questions. Um, so, I, so tackle one at a time. So the first one, what do they do right? Um, you know, ideas are not unique, right? People know that execution is key. Um, at the time, you know, Blue Apron had two other competitors from the get-go and they were out executing the other two for, for a long time. And then they got, they got their ass kicked eventually. <laughs> but um, in the early days, I think it was honestly, the CEO just had really good strategic judgment 
he's one of the smartest people I've met. And this guy also went to HBS a couple of years before me. And, and, and I'll say one, I'll say a couple of things that we did well, a couple of things that we didn't do well. Um, he is, he just has really good innate strategic sense of key decisions because in the early days of a startup, you don't really make decisions based on a ton of data. I mean, as early stage investors, we don't make decisions based on a ton of data. So it's incomplete data set. You can't be like, oh, I'm going to run a perfect experiment because that doesn't exist. So I think it was a lot combination of luck and like really relentless focus on the quality of the execution. And Blade was able to attract really good talent and everybody, you know, was very aligned with the mission, uh, which is to make home cooking accessible at home. See, I can still recite that. Um, and and, and, and very passionate about the business. So everybody's very emotionally invested in the business and they really wanted to be there. And that was really powerful. I said the first 300 hires are probably like that. Um, I've had really a lot of friends from Blue Apron days because we all work you know, from different departments collaboratively, long hours and all that stuff. So I think there's a relentless focus on the execution quality and speed. Speed is very important um, because you're always like trying to, out compete and then you're you know in this particular situation we're also creating a new market so uh, there is also like the speed this every day you're not moving forward you're moving backwards so so that that's that's that and i think that like the flip side i think what happened to the business is that it's operationally very complex business so we t it, it's the analogy i'll give is like we launched a version of hotcakes and we're just selling them like their hotcakes going off shelf for the first four years. We didn't have to do much. Every week was the best week ever at Blue Apron History. This is, this is literally like for the first four years, board meetings, board members didn't ask any questions because the business is just like executing. So you have something that sells really well. And that actually prevents you from experimenting and innovating ahead because what do, you, what do you have to decide? It's like innovators dilemma. It's like, well, we have this version of hotcake that sells, but our customers telling us that like the hotcake kind of takes too long to cook, but then they sell so well. And they're like, oh, we have to launch more. It like takes a lot of operational work. And the bigger you get, the more complicated it gets to like iterate, especially in a non-pure software business. This is an e-commerce business. <sighs> so, this was very, very hard. And we finally were forced to do that six months before we were going public. And this was like a lot to take on. So, and then so our ass got kicked after we went public, which is horrible because you don't want your ass get kicked once you become a public company. And being a public company is really challenging because everybody watches stock price every day. Being a private company, you can just like hide it under the rug. Nobody knows. Um, so, so that's kind of, unfortunately, I think like what happened later stage of the business. To answer your second question on, on product management, um, I did not study technical degrees and I wish I did. So I, I don't, I don't really have any concept of that. Although I would say that like, you know, I played video games growing up, whatever that means, you know, something. And I like, I like kind of tinkering and building, but I was not a technical person. And I think I got the firsthand learning experience being a founder, trying to work with engineers and building websites like digital product. And I was like, I have no idea. When they tell me it's too hard, I have no idea. When they tell me it's like to take this long, I have no idea. That's kind of what made me want to go into product management. Product management, um, the way I think about it is like a, you're shaping software experiences to accomplish business objectives, the KPIs you want to push and serve your customers. And then you, your job is to like understand the technical constraints and like try to figure out what is the bang for buck, best bang for gut buck, meaning impact per unit of effort. So that's how you decide what to build next. And then everything you're building, you are trying to move some business metrics while at the same time not sacrificing customers because sometimes the customer stuff is hard to measure. So it's like the triangle and there are like three forces and you're balancing them. In reality, what this job is, the glorified version is you're the mini CEO. The not glorified version is hurting cats. So it depends on like which mental picture you want it, but it's kind of like a little bit of both. So I would say at a more junior level is a lot of technical understanding, not like, oh, I can write code because I don't write code. It's like you conceptually understand like 
how APIs work and web development frameworks. You work with engineers enough to be able to grasp that. And then you, you then you're the half business person, half technical person, and you go negotiate with marketing sales, whoever, but you're businessy enough to be like, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this, or we're going to do half version of this. And you're going to walk out of here half happy. And you're going to walk out of here half happy. And then we're going to like build this as the next thing because everybody asks you for stuff. Uh, so that's kind of in the nutshell what product management is. And, um, and I think it's a very interesting skill set from like kind of diving, tying back to the investment thing or the founder thing. Um, you know, when I look at businesses now, you don't have to have a product person on the founding team, but if you're pro if you're, if you're something that you're building is like very product driven, what does that mean? Like if you're building a consumer social app, or you're building a what mobile experience for, uh, I'm making something up. You're building a mobile experience connecting the best nine market stands with consumers, like a discovery, like how do you navigate the best nine markets? That to me is like, a, a product experience is pretty important because why would someone like stay retention? How would they, why would they engage? In that case, I'm looking for someone on the founding team that has that consumer product experience, like the user experience sensibility, how do they think about user interactions? Um, and then if not, then like at least like the, the, the traits, the like you got to better understand your customers. Who are you targeting? So these are like the product related discipline, like understand what the value proposition is, understanding what the user needs are, and like, how do you like prioritize and distill it down to things that actually are critical to validate your hypotheses? Because in the early days, you have a bunch of hypotheses and you're trying to validate and validate them to get to product market fit. So that, that kind of thinking is very helpful. And from the investor side, you know, it's kind of the flip mirror of that, how to think about like how to ask, I mean, when we're investing, we're a C-stage investor. In the US, that half the time means we're talking to companies pre-launch or pre-product. The other half of the time, we're talking to companies just launched, but pre-product market fit. So a lot of times I ask questions to try to get a sense of, you're like, oh, we're in beta. It's okay. I was like, how do you think about what are the next set of things you, you need to build? What, what is the wedge? Because you can build a thousand things. Why do you think this is the important wedge to go into market with? What are you looking for? Um, you know, once you're in pilot, if it's a B2B, B2B software, right? If it's a consumer business, then I really want to see how they think about the user experience, stuff like that. Yeah. Mm, and I think that's a very good segue for us to get into, I guess, what you are focusing on now as a partner at Next View Ventures. I guess for right. our audience who may not be that, not that familiar with that already, can you just share a little bit in terms of your investment focus, thesis, yeah. check size, and so on and so forth? Yeah. So um, we, so next few, we've been around for 10 years. Uh, we're currently investing out of our fourth fund that we closed last year. A fourth fund is a hundred million dollar fund that we do mainly North America investments. Um, we focus, we're stage focused uh, and pretty broad uh, thematic focus. So we are only do seed. So seed in the US is more of a spectrum as opposed to a distinct stage. At the early end, you, you can be two people with a deck concept stage. Uh, on the other end, you can be, you're doing 100K or 200K a month in revenue. And you're not yet post product market fit. Um, so the round size for a seed in, in the US can be as low as 800K a million dollars for a pre seed, people call it pre seed companies or it could be a four or even four and a half, $5 million rounds, which by the way is crazy because 10 years ago, $5 million rounds are series A's in the, I mean, $3 million rounds were series A's in the US 10 years ago. So we can write, we lead, we're, we're, the other thing to call us, we only lead investments. We don't do small follow checks. So we're, our styles, we build strong conviction and either have very strong conviction and get involved in the business, take a board seat, get the ownership we want, and then we'll write a big check. So at the low end of the check size can be a couple hundred K at the high end could be two and a half million. Um, and you know, what kind of companies do we invest? So we have a thematic focus that we describe as the everyday economy. So what that means is 
there are many different types of everyday users. When you and I are at work, we're the everyday worker, but we're not the only type of everyday worker. We can be a white collar worker. So we think about future of work. How do we work remotely? Um, if you're a software engineer, we think about how you get work done, how you interact with GitHub, how you interact with um, you know, feature releases, QA. You can be a data scientist or you can be a non-technical user in the organization who wants access to data. So we think about data toolings. You can be a frontline worker like delivery drivers or 7-Eleven workers and like, how do you get trained? For example, just a few things that we've thought about in the past. And the everyday consumer, then we think about food, we think about health, we think about entertainment, we think about personal finance, how do you save money, how do you get rid of student debt. So we invest both at the application layer, meaning we the products and services that touch this consumer or the everyday user directly, or we invest in the enabling technology layer, meaning you might not know that this is a company that powers the end action that impacts the everyday user life, but that's the enabling technology. So what we don't do, so you're like, okay, that's everything. So what we don't do is um, things I would call like, first of all, we need to see something as a, that has technology leverage. So if you're a pure retail business uh, or like pure hardware business, that's difficult for us. Uh, we have done hardware software investments, but most of the time uh, it is uh, software technology leverage. Uh, or it minimally has a kind of, some kind of e-commerce um, element. And the other thing is, so things like two layers down the infrastructure stack, like, you know, next generation uh, database infrastructure or, um, you know, cybersecurity is not very everyday consumer or everyday worker, things that are more traditional enterprise SaaS that sells directly to the CIOs of Fortune 100 companies. Uh, the B2B software investments that we make tend to be a little bit more bottoms up or um, individual team adoption and then spread across as opposed to top-down purchase decision-making from a you know, chief information officer or IT department. Uh, so that's kind of how I would categorize what we do and don't do. Okay, and uh, feel free to share maybe kind of like a few recent yeah. investments that you have done with us so that people can sort of like relate yeah. and you know, who knows, maybe there are even co-investors within this. Yeah, so, um, we, so I'll call out a few later stage companies and I'll call out a few recent investments. Um, we have a company uh, called Skills, S-K-I-L-L-Z. They just went public last year. They're a leader in API. Uh, they're, they're building APIs to power cash-based gaming. So let's say you have, you're a mobile developer of a bowling app and you can enable cash gaming, like me and you competing in, in the bowling app and see who wins. And we actually get a little cash prize by implementing their API. So they're like, they're now like, I don't know, like a seven, $8 billion company um, in the public market. Um, we are investors in another company that just went public recently called ThreadUp. This is a company that is in the re-commerce space. Uh, so what that means is that uh, recircular e-commerce. So they sell secondhand, uh, mostly kids and women's clothes. Um, and um, they also just went public. I think it's like a billion, half, $2 billion market cap business. Uh, we are in a, a company called Attentive, Attentive Mobile. They're a New York-based company. They're a leader in SMS-based marketing. So in the US, unlike, unlike in Taiwan or, or China, you don't actually, the, the SMS marketing landscape is still pretty nascent. So you don't get a thousand texts on your phone from random people. Uh, and brands and retailers are just starting to in, leverage that channel. In the US, SMS or text is very private um, until very recently. So, so Attentive does a good job of helping brands and retailers build that relationship with their consumers through text. So they're kind of the enabling marketing layer that powers that. Um, we, so those are like a few later stage examples. And then another fun one, this company called Whoop, um, which is a, a advanced fitness tracker. So if you watch golf, you actually have seen them on PGA tours because a lot of golfers, uh, they're kind of the official wearables for PGA. And I think on the, the broadcasting, you can actually see, they basically have the most advanced hardware tracking in the industry. So it's more of a software play, uh, but they sell, they sell 
a piece of hardware, but their business model is actually more like a software business because you're self-subscription and it helps you track recovery and sleep. So a lot of athletes from LeBron James to a bunch of other folks have used them, not on a sponsorship, just use them. And then they're not going down market to kind of the everyday consumer, but they started more pro athletes because it helps them train, um, kind of manage their training. So that's on the later stage side that companies we invested like a decade ago are now kind of you know matured. A uh, few recent investments uh, that I personally worked on. Um, I did a company called FAM, F-A-M. This is a, a consumer social side. They're building a video centric, uh, Gen Z focused social network. I mean, social network is a really hard category to invest because you know you just don't know. But this team is really impressive, and they they haven't announced it, but they just closed the fifteen million dollars Series A. Um, another two that are slightly different one is a company called Prequel, P R E Q Q U E L, um, Prequel Co Co. What they're doing is basically um, making implementing data infrastructure stacks from extraction to warehousing to transforming to the BI and visualization layer uh, very easy with a bundled out of the box solution so that you can get your data stack infrastructure stack up and running hopefully in minutes not in weeks so you can focus on getting the insights and focus on building the software you need to build uh, so this is a pretty recent investment um, and the last one um, also pretty recent is a company called HomePace. So HomePace, what they do is they allow you to take um, some money out of your home uh, by sharing kind of like a co-ownership agreement by sharing, co-sharing the upside, eventual upside of your home if one day you were to sell your house. So let's say I'm a 60 year old retired couple and I've been in my house for 20 years and I have some paper games and but I don't want to leave my house but I want to spend put more money into my retirement account but I also don't want to take on more debt so I can basically like it's kind of like a European put option for those who are in finance so like you can structure an agreement so that home pays become a co-investor in your home and you get some you say fifty thousand dollars or something cash up front but then eventually when you sell, you share a little bit of upside and downside. So the, the concept here is that a lot of, you know, kind of it enables a lot of financial flexibility, whether as a new homeowner who wants to buy a slightly more expensive home or as a existing homeowner who wants to be able to unlock a little bit of home equity without having to sell or, or move. That's, that's really cool. So I think, you know, like I could definitely relate to, especially a few examples that you just mentioned, I think there are definitely some other investors in the room that potentially could have further conversation with you. And I'm curious because I always believe that as an investor, one of the toughest thing, because you know, usually at the top tier markets and ecosystem, money is commodity. And a lot mm -hmm. of time, usually the toughest deals, you have to really chase them and then you need to differentiate yourself as someone who bring in value. What do you do, you know, like to differentiate yourself um, as an investor to get into all of these top deals? Yeah, um, I'm trying to think. So, so there, there are two things at the firm level and at the partner level. I mean, at the firm level, you know, it's the firm brand name and what we can market is like what's unique about next few. What we typically say is that a couple of things. One, we are actually hands on lead investor. So you will see, you're thinking of a lot of seed funds out there, but the seed funds who can actually lead deals and say yes without waiting for other people to say yes, do the work as a lead investor, post investment, actually spending time with companies um, and take the moral responsibility when things are going well or not going well. That's actually more rare. I mean, we still have competition uh, in that category, but it's not it's probably like 20, 30 firms in the US. It's not 600. Um, so that's one. Now, that being said, I would say usually what we tell founders is that we are very collaborative partnerships. Most venture firms have a decent amount of politics and it's very individualistic in terms of how they structure their economics or how they actually work. Um, we kind of, we tell founders like you you buy one, get three free in the sense of like, you talk to any of our founders and they'll be like, Oh, Melody left my deal, but Dave helped me with this and Rob helped me with that. 
And that's very powerful. You know, what it comes down to is founder, founder reference. So when we get to the stage, if we get founders to call our other founders, we can usually win, not 100%, but our win rate is probably like 90% um, once we get to a term sheet stage. The other thing I would say is that every one of us, you know, had either been a founder or operator before investing. So this is not to say I'm going to help build your business because I'm not, right? My job is to invest in teams that are going to make most of the right decisions. But I think having gone through that ourselves gives us, I would say two things. One is empathy and two is operating muscle. By operating muscle, I don't mean like, oh, this is the right analytic stacks to use because five years from now, that knowledge is going to be stale. So to tactical answer is not very helpful. What is more helpful is like, I like innately understand what, how the sausage making process feels like. It's not that straightforward. It is, culture is not that straightforward. Growing from a team of 30 to 60 is not that straightforward. And I, I, I know like how that feels like and can hopefully be a more effective sounding board to the founders. So that's at, at the firm level. Um, and of course, like, you know, sh- kind of being, having kind of winning records and now having companies that are more mature can point to that's helpful. At the individual, how I compete, you know, I say that um, I lean in a lot of the, 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 the kind of my personal company building experience. And I think hopefully that reflects in the quality of the conversations that I have with founders, like ask smart questions and, and really understand their business. And specifically I point to four, two things that I can be more of helpful probably than your average investor, um, product and hiring. Um, product because I've done it and I can be another set of eyes and sounding board to that. And hiring because at I, 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 Labor specifically, I had to grow up as a hiring manager from like never manage anybody. And I had to hire senior people, VP level people, I'd hired product people, I've hired designers, I've hired analytics and data scientists. I'd, I'd hire like 30 plus people in two years. So there's a lot of hiring. And I also, uh, so I, I think that's like one of the things that a lot of founders never really had experience doing, even though they were experienced industry people. Um, so I try to do that. And I'll say the other thing is, you know, honestly, like I, I'm reflecting one of the most recent investments. So prequel, um, I, I actually know this because I know that they were t- deciding between us and another very reputable firm. I found out who they were afterwards. And to be honest with you, I was quite surprised that we won. Um, and, 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 you know, because they're like the GP there is like 15 years older than me and they're, they're like a respected name. So they're like a peer firm and very respected. And I was reflecting on that. Uh, obviously it's one example. I think that it's a combination of like, you know, the re- personal report you built with the founders because founders want, so every founder choose differently. Someone just optimized for the highest price. Some optimized for like, hey, do I want to, can I, can I trust this person? Can I spend like the next five, seven years being a partner with this person? So being able to build that rapport is pretty important. And it's tougher to do that through Zoom. It's much easier to do that through in person. Uh, so that's a challenge. And the other thing I think is probably just like, who do, who do we think actually like know our business? And that was pretty interesting because that was like a, <laughs> that was a data infrastructure investment. Um, so I lean in on a lot of like, hey, I help build a data science team, and analytics team at Blue Apron. I understand the problem you're solving. And I think that probably was very helpful as well. And they did some founder references calling the founders I work with. And they, I know they all said great things. I'm really grateful for that. And I think that helped as well. Um, but I think you lean in on those things and you know, to eventually get to a record, you know, winning record, and then you're like associated with iconic companies, but that takes a long time. Um, so, so I think those are, those are, those are kind of the, but I, I'll tell you, I've lost, you know, I've had term sheets out and I've lost a couple of deals in the past before too. Um, sometimes because I was too cheap, sometimes because I was too slow, sometimes just because. Um, so you win some, you lose some, but um, if you don't lose at all, that probably means that you're not taking enough risk as a fund. Uh, so that's the one thing I would say. Yeah, well, I love that, you know. So I think we are running 
a little bit over time, but I, I still want to get to this last part. And for our friends in the audience, you can start getting your questions ready and you know, like get ready for the webcam and so you can ask questions directly with Melody. But you know, as we wrap, you know, now you're sitting in New York. I guess, you know, I actually check. It's like 12,500 kilometers away. And you know, like, <laughs> as someone who grew up in Taiwan and went all the way there, and then the other day we were talking about, I guess, the limitation that a lot of the startups really are facing here in Taiwan, especially in the software side. And we're talking about mm -hmm. project versus product. And you as an mm -hmm. expert in the product side and also with some family background with entrepreneurship and startup, I would love to actually get your take in terms of what you are seeing sort of like from the outside in terms of what the startup founders in Taiwan can potentially think a little bit more. And also, I guess, you know, that probably also applies to investors as well. Yeah. Um, so, so what what Elisa alluded to in terms of family backgrounds? Um, my my father started a software business in Taiwan when I was in high school, and he still is a venture back business. Um, I'm not going to name the specific company, uh, but uh, you know it's a three four hundred person company. Uh, probably some of you have come across them at one point. It is very hard to build a software business in Taiwan because the market is so small. <laughs> um, you know, like the way we think about, I was just kind of giving you a market context. If I see a market slide that says, the market size is 5 billion. I was like, ah, it's too small for venture. And you're like, what? And US dollar, I was, why is that? Well, the way I think about it shorthand, first of all, entrepreneurs are gonna inflate whatever market size. So I need to like take a cut of that. And then I'm gonna be like, to get to 1% of any market is very difficult. So if you're a $5 billion market total, and it would take you, let's say it takes you five years, excellent execution to get to 1% of the market. That's only 50 million. So that's not big enough for a billion dollar outcome. Um, because, and then why do I care about billion dollar outcome? Because I have a hundred million dollar fund. You know, at exit, if I own 10%, I only want X my fund. And I need two more of these in order to 3x net or not even net gross, right? So like we have LPs. So, so that's kind of how I think about market size, which is unfortunate because there's many things. So back to Taiwan, I mean, obviously like, so I think a very hard number one is like, you have to start internationally. I've seen my father do that. And it's really, really tricky. Um, Taiwan has advantage because the software talent and just the technical talent is really good. But I think that, I think it's probably better now. Um, but I think to build an international kind of client, if you're a B2B client presence, BD sales, I mean, selling in every country is very different. You need local sales teams, really hard to hire. I mean, they still struggle with that until today. Like they don't have, I don't think they, they want to get into North American market. They have to like bring him out every time they want to sell something, but that doesn't really work at scale. So that is very difficult. Um, so consumer is a slightly different story. And I think then like, China is a really difficult market because that, it's not that easy, you know, even though we have similarities in culture and language. So it's, it, it's, and then Southeast Asia is very fragmented. Every country is very different. Now you have seen examples of Southeast Asia as like Grab and some other players that started in Singapore, Southeast Asia and be able to like dominate. Um, and I think maybe that that's a little bit of a result of the DNA from, you know, kind of the aggressiveness, Western style, um, which I, I'll touch on the second point, which is like, I think it's, this probably goes back to the funding environment. In the US, you can be like, I don't know how to make money until later, or like I can lose money until later because I have venture. Not to say you should build irresponsible businesses, but at, at any given moment in time as a company, you're balancing growth versus profitability, right? So if you don't have venture to kind of help you continue to focus on growth, of course you have no choice to focus on profitability. So when you focus on profitability, and I've seen it again with kind of my, my, the, the business my father started, they're an EBITDA positive business. And, but then they're like, it's like a really weird story for investors because like, well, you're not really growing that much, but you've been like more than 10 years old, but you're turning out EBITDA, but your revenue skill is not that big. Like, I don't know how to package you because like, it's really tricky because investors are like, they, they, their shortcut is if you're not growing like 3X year over year, there's no market pull. Like you're not working in a market that's interesting enough. 
but that's a really tricky proposition for people who also want to like be profitable or have to be profitable because you don't have lined up venture or enough of a venture ecosystem to support you to focus on growth. So I think that is a practical challenge. And the last thing I'll say is um, product versus project. So we touched a little bit about that. And that has something to do with number two, which is when you have to be profitable, you have to bid on projects to like get to the product you want to build as opposed to here's a product we want to build. And then we would like to sell this productized as opposed to the problem with projects is that everything is custom, right? Like, and then and, and when everything is custom, you don't have really like a unified point of view and, and the cost structure and the way you think the business is architects is very different than, hey, I'm just churning on a software product and we either have an enterprise sales strategy or we have a bottoms up self-serve strategy and you can have unified pricing and you, it's much more scalable growth strategy. Um, and with that, I think, you know, I don't know, I, I, it's hard for me to comment because I, I'm not as involved in the landscape, but I think traditionally because Taiwan is more hardware and manufacturing driven, as, a, as an ecosystem, we don't yet have a deep bench of product, software product talent. And project managers are different than product managers. Project managers keep the train running. Product managers decide what is the next iteration of the train that we need to build. Those are slightly different skill sets. Yes, product people manage projects as well, but I think if product people have to be more like, they understand the market, where the market is going, where the customers are going, where the business is going, and again, synthesize that. And I think that's a, you know, I was in New York 10 years ago, didn't have a deep product bench. So that's why people are like, oh, you can't build large companies in New York because you guys don't actually know how to, and then now we have more because we have more companies that have matured, have grown up, and then they churn out product talent. And then they go, or like Uber's New York office turn out some senior product people, and then they go start businesses. So we now have, but it took 10 years in kind of from my personal vantage point, because last time I was in venture in New York, I feel like we didn't have this deep bench of companies. I mean, myself included. When I was first getting to head a product, like a VP of product role, I had like, less than 10 peers in a city who I can compare notes with. And every head of product job was like trying to recruit me among a few other candidates because we don't have that many senior product people who have scaled with the business to a different level. So I think that just takes time. But um, so those are my high level thoughts. Well, that's very interesting. I guess, you know, like I, I thought a lot about how Taiwan in terms of the innovation ecosystem can be more on the map. That's kind of like a very core mission with Anchor. But I, I suppose, you know, like before, I never thought of it from the product angle, but I think, you know, you probably touch on a, a very important layer that's um, a little bit still missing here, here in Taiwan. So, that, so that's very interesting. And mm -hmm. I guess with time, we still have so many things that I guess we can, we can touch up on. And I, we can go into more and more, I guess, with the, the Q&A and Ask Me Anything session. But now I want to open the floor. So, so basically, if you have a question, and I think just so that it's easier for us to do this with a little bit of order, if you can maybe kind of like raise your hand, either we can see you or, you know, like with that little thing in the bottom to raise your hand, then we can, we can call you out. Or you can basically just kind of like raise your hand so I can see you and then you can unmute yourself to ask your question. But, you know, like, first of all, I want to thank Melody for all of this sharing so far. And I think, you know, I always, super enjoyable talking to you, a lot of very candid um, perspectives and, and always very enjoyable. So any questions that we have from the audience before we break into the, we have, Sophia, are you, is that you raising? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> any, anyone having a question here? No, I, I'm not. Raising my hand, I just want to say I enjoy this speech a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Glad to be here. Yeah. Any any other question that you might have? Actually, you know, like I, I will probably jump in because earlier when you mentioned, oh, someone else raised her hand. Oh, great. Okay, Sophie from Edrex. Hey, welcome. All right, go ahead. Unmute yourself and then feel free to just kind of like jump in. Hi, hi, Melody. Thank you, Elisa, uh, inviting me. 
I just, uh, um, um, maybe I can introduce a bit of myself. I'm Sophie, uh, I'm an associate at Eberts. I just joined Eberts last year. Previously, I also have, a, uh, I had 10 years work experience in the capital market as a fund manager uh, uh, in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I'm in the venture side and mm -hmm. uh, at Eberx, we, um, we have our own thesis that's pretty much, uh, that's very uh, focused on uh, founder. We call ourselves founder centric and we are mm -hmm. rather round neutral. So we can invest in the seed or all the way to a uh, later stage as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but we focus more on the founder side. So because you also mentioned that you now uh, with your current uh, 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 job uh, as a partner uh, at the venture side, uh, I, I just wonder, you mentioned quite a lot about uh, the business uh, that you look in look, look at and uh, investment angle as well. But I just wonder because you know all the uh, investor VC investor we all have that you know same uh, mandate that we all have to mm -hmm. figure out whether these founder is you know like a mm -hmm. a good a good a good chap right a, a good mm -hmm. person to invest into. Whether uh, you also briefly touch upon that you said whether this is a person you want to work with right mm -hmm. for the next maybe five to seven years. I just mm -hmm. wonder curious like. Do you have like a thesis about, you know, uh, reading people, reading whether this is the founder that you feel, you know, you you would uh, respect and work with? Yeah. Is there yeah. any like pattern yeah. or, or yeah? Um, it's hard. It's very hard. So again, if I figure it out, I would be sitting on a beach. But, uh, you know, I, I, I'll tell you kind of how I currently think about it and how we as a firm uh, think about it. So usually as... At any stage or specifically at C stage, we think about three things for, for the business. People, uh, team market product. Um, and then, you know, I think given the seed product is last, not because product is not important because product is most of the time not built. So the way I usually think about it is like, first of all, is the market attractive enough, big enough? Um, mm -hmm. And then I think about, and I, I would say some different investors have different debates and some are like team first, we, we ignore the market. So like YC, for example, right? They just, I think their strategy is just invest in like impressive people and out of 200 per batch, a couple of them will work out a bunch of them will pivot and they don't care. Uh, but because their cost base is so low, right? They buy it at like, you know, $2 million or two and a half million dollar valuation. I think not looking at market is tricky because you can't, it's hard to bank on a pivot. So I think you have to be comfortable enough in the starting position of, is this big of an ocean to swim? You, yes, you might not be like at this pier, you might go that pier, but like, is this ocean broadly enough, big enough? I mean, sometimes pivot works. So that's how I think about market. On um, people, you know, I, I think it's, generally speaking, I'm looking for like, for lack of better, so a couple of things. One is what I call founder market fit. So what, what I mean by that is, um, again, I think about every business is like, what is the superpower you need to have this business be really successful? Um, and that is slightly different. So like I'll give example of Attentive, which is in our portfolio company, this mobile SMS marketing solution. For that business to be successful, it's not, you're not building Google search engine. So the technical solution is probably pretty similar at the end when you have competition. So it's probably about sales and go to market. So like, the, the, so then like, do we have a he seeking missile at this founding team who we think can just like really out execute everybody at the sales and marketing side of things. And the advantage there is that we actually backed this team previously at a previous company. So it's also the second time next to be founding team. So we knew that we have high confidence in that. And, and another example, like consumer social app that I worked on the reason I invested is that this team, so the two guys, they spent a couple years at both Instagram and Facebook. And they were like, they're one of those people you talk to. They're just like, they just like study social networks as a mission. And they have like thought through it in front and back and sideways. They talk to high school kids, stand in front of NYU, give out pizza to have people like try their stuff. They just have this relentless focus and and relevant experience. One of them actually was very early on Instagram, right after the Instagram acquisition, focusing on safety features. And they're building a video app for teenagers. So that's actually pretty important, the sensitivity around that. So like, and I'm like, okay, these are product people. 
so they can iterate to get to a place where the product will make sense. So I would never invest in something in consumer social without some kind of strong product background. So that's, so that's how one thing I think about, like the superpower is matched to like the particular business model. The other thing I would say is just like, I mean, this is hard to quantify, but it's like the general like exceptionalness. I mean, this sounds a little bit elitist, like, but you, you meet hundreds of founders and you just know who's like, who's like top quartile, who's not like, because you just see so many of them. And you, some people just like five minutes in conversation, you're like, I'm not going to invest. Some people 15 minutes in conversation. I mean, I'd had this meeting the other week. I hate the industry. They're, they're building heart IOT device on nurses, basically <laughs> body camera on nurses, selling to hospital systems trying to like get the whales of like four or $5 million ACV contracts. Oh my God. They're like pre-launch tons of technical risk, computer vision, blah, blah, blah. But she is very impressive. She knows her stuff. She knows the hospitals. She knows why she's going to nurses as opposed to doctors. It was a very dynamic conversation. And I basically yesterday in a, in a partner meeting, I was like, look guys, I hate this market. We'd never in 10 years invest in anything in these sales hospital because it's a pain. But this founder is very impressive. She has unique insight. The third thing I would call out is you, you would meet companies and they'll be like, oh, we're building whatever. And I was like, okay, I, I'm looking for like unique insights, meaning this is not the first time you're tackling this market or this is not the first time you're working on this problem. But like, what do you have that's like a little different than someone else? Because I think that tells me that like you're going to be executing sm more smarter. So like on this nursing body camera thing example she's like everybody else is working on doctors and audio solution nlp for like scribing so that we can save time from typing stuff into emrs but this is why that's her own approach and this is why i'm doing nurses and i was like oh okay i mean i'm not a healthcare specialist but like i was like first principle like okay that actually makes sense and then she talked about like why nurses are going to be better in terms of contract why nurses control a lot more operating budget and da, 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 da. I mean, to be validated, but at least it's like unique and interesting and different than everything else I've heard in this sector. So, so I think that's the other thing I would call out. Um, and then the last one is probably pretty standard is like, you know, you can't, you know, depending on how technical the product is, right? Like you need to have the technical side, you need to have the business side. Um, you know, I think sometimes we, some other firms will back like really technical research teams without any like commercial no's. <laughs> we were probably not that because I would sometimes meet teams like, oh my God, you're too academic. Like I've said mm. no to that, those town founder because I was like, I, you have no idea how to go to market. <laughs> you're just like, oh, I'm just gonna build it and people will come like, well, that's not usually how it happens. Um, and so I, I think we are a group that probably needs to see a pretty clear answer, at least hypotheses around if it's consumer business, how are you thinking about consumer go to market and marketing? And the answer cannot just be, I'm going to buy ads on Facebook because everybody else is doing the exact same thing. And on the B2B side, it's like, where do you start? Why do you think that's the right part of the wedge to go in? And then like kind of get a better quality understanding of how you're thinking about approaching customers, even without a sales pipeline where a pilot's lined up. So. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Melody. Thank Thanks, you. Sophie. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Any any other question before we move into, oh, any, go ahead. Oh, hi, Melody. Uh, this is Annie. Uh, just a quick background. So recently moved back from New York as well, uh, currently doing fund investing. But before this, uh, I was in New York as a management consultant, in investment banking, and working startups before. Uh, so I think in general, two questions for you. First question is, I think from your background, um, you know, business and a product and then VC. Uh, maybe, could you possibly explain a little bit about the rationale behind going through these steps? I think one is that you could probably go from product to more products to more scaling. Yeah, businesses. yeah, 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 yeah. Right yeah. And what is the personality or skill set requirements in terms of being successful in these two routes? And I think second question would be along those lines of if you were to give advice for junior people from a business angle who uh -huh. want to do product first uh -huh. before doing investing, particularly yeah. for the role of wanting to have more deep sector expertise, yeah. uh, what would your advice be? Okay. Um, yeah, the first one is, you know, careers is, is 
random. Um, I, I mean, I would say the way I think about kind of careers that you draw a bunch, every time you like make a decision, you jump from a point here to a point here. And then you like draw a dot, draw a line. And then like from that point on, you have new set of information. And, and then you like plot out, you can, I can go here, I can go here, I can go here. And then you like draw another line once your decision is made. So like eventually it might look like that, but I feel like at 22, I was making a decision about why do I go to Time Warner's venture group versus private equity? And my decision was like, I literally had a pro con list, I think, um, because I'm that kind of decision maker. And the rationale was, oh, why not? You know, I'm going to go to probably go to business school. I'll probably look more differentiated as a candidate. And this sounds like a lot of fun. I read TechCrunch. This is 2008. And sounds like a lot of fun. And whatever the heck venture capital means. So that got me to the rabbit hole. And then from then on to be a founder, again, it was like, oh, my opportunity cost is pretty low. I'm in business school. Uh, this will probably help me if I want to be an investor again later, later, later. This experience will probably help me. And by the way, I can be a founder. I can like use this opportunity to keep my relationship on the venture side warm because I get to talk to VCs. And then, so it's not going to be a waste of time. And I kind of get to learn how to build software. So uh, then it was that, and then it failed. And then, then I come out of school as a product management, like, oh, because I want to build software as I shared earlier. And then I never, I was never intended because of that decision. I was never intended to be like, I'm going to be a VP of product. That's like my career calling. I literally was like, you know, if you think of it, like, it was like video games or like, you have the, you, each character has like skill set chart, right? I'm like, okay, I can do ops. I can raise money. I know how to do finance. I'm not going to be a good brand marketer, but I can be a good, you know, performance marketer because I'm pretty analytical. So the only thing I don't know how to do if I have to be a founder again, because my previous founder dished me is to know how to build software. So let me go get that skill set. So that's how I got into product. And then the next thing led to, I was like VP of product running a 35 person team of a company about to go public. And I was like, I hate my job. And because once you're at that level, you're not doing work anymore. I tell my people like my all days, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. in back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meetings and negotiating and maneuvering with other C-level people so my people can get to work. And I just can't deal with politics and BS like that because I, I'm, I'm the most happy was when I'm earlier stage. I just get in the room with head of marketing, with the CEO, I'm like, okay, here's the best things for the company and then we're gonna go do it. And then we're just like, not waste time. So I, my realization then was like, okay, I would never wanna be a senior exec at a large company. So then I was like, okay, well that sucks. So I should leave because it's gonna go public and it's gonna get worse. Oh, so let me go, my first intuition is, oh, let me go to get another job at a series A startup, be a VP of product and do it again. And then I was like, well, if this company becomes successful, five years later, it's the exact same thing. I'm stuck again. <laughs> and then the other thing is like, I actually was interviewing with um, a really successful company at the time in New York, uh, Series A, Series B, they were trying to bring in a VP of product. And I was interviewing and I was also talking to NextView because they reached out to me. And I was telling my husband about like these two potential options. And then he was like, don't take that product job. You're going to be bored in six months. I was like, why? You're like, he's like, you're a personality that like, you cannot just like go in and deploy the playbook. And now you know how to do this job and you're just going to do that and you'll get bored in six months. And I was like, oh, okay. So I should go back to be an investor. <laughs> so I, that's how I landed back to investing. The only the other one last thing I would say is that like, because I like early stage. Um, so investor is actually one of those jobs that, like you can repeat the early stage thing again and again. I'll tell you right now, the, the, the negative is that like, I don't get to be, I'm like the grandparent. I'm not the parent. So you're emotionally less influenced, which probably is a good thing because as a startup person, your highs are high, your lows are low as a grandparent is more like that. So it's probably better for our mental health. Um, and in terms of your quick question of like personality, uh, they're very different, like they're extrovert investors, they're introvert investors. I, I think the like personality is less important. I think you have to have the passion to like, two things. You have to have passion to like interact and spend time with founders. And two is that you have to be excited about that. Otherwise you shouldn't do this job because you'd like have 10 meetings a week with founders. The other thing is you have to be very comfortable with making decisions without a lot of data.
And that's actually both true for early stage investing and early stage operating. Um, and I know you have another question about business people want to go into product. I would quickly say that I would say, so I, when I interviewed my first product job, I read the JD and says, oh, SQL proficient. I was like, what is SQL? And as I like went online, took a, I think it was like a three hour Stanford data, intro to database class. I was like, okay, I now know how to write SQL. I mean, and I went into interview and I practiced, you know, if elsewhere, blah, blah, blah. And I obviously I was never quite qu quizzed on SQL on that job. However, I got to the job and I had to pull data. And then there's a startup, there's no data scientist. So I just had to do, I was like, oh, thank God I learned how to do SQL. So let me like monkey around in the database and like pull stuff out. The, the, lesson, the reason I want to share that is because anything can be learned. And, at, and then like non-technical people, you know, I've hired both technical background PMs and non-technical background PMs. And my most successful PMs is actually a blip. There are people who came out of Stanford CS degree and she was not successful. And my other PM on my team who was Berkeley CS, double ECS, and he's like, he was telling me that I'm actually the most technical product person on our entire team at the time. And I think it's just, it's like, you have to kind of, you know, you can understand a conceptual understanding of technology without actually understanding like the code. And I think if you have the will, there's also the internet and like these days is much easier. So I actually think it's not that huge of a barrier as you think. Um, but that was something that I was very conscious of because I came from, I mean, back then it was also like, oh, nobody likes MBAs because they don't do any, they don't know how to do anything, which is kind of true. And so then you have to, you overcompensate, like you have good personal, you know, interpersonal skills, to, like be friends with engineers. And then you ask them questions and you like, the last thing I would throw out there uh, is product people exist not to write code because that's engineer's job. Product people exist to fill the white space of whatever the heck engineer don't want to do, which is a lot of things. So you can be very helpful in a lot of different things. And then you help them to feel like we're building something that's important, that is the highest priority of the business and see this is how that we move the business needles. And I shield you from all the bullshit that you don't want to deal with. And then I make sure you guys are not wasting time. And that's a huge value add. And then maybe you take on design as well because I had to in early days with no designers. But whatever that is, the white space is pretty big. So I think actually, there's a lot of room for business savvy PMs to operate and be effective. Fantastic, thank you. I see uh, Lori also raised your hand and I think that would be our last question before we go into the round circle. We're running. Better make it a good one. Yeah, go ahead, welcome. <laughs> Hi, Melody. Um, thank you, Alyssa, for inviting me and, and organizing this. Hi, Melody, thank you for sharing. Um, so I'm Lori, I'm working with um, catcher technology. Um, I'm starting off the corporate venture arm in, in Singapore right now. So I'm actually joining from Singapore. Um, so I think starting a investment fund, not necessarily like um, investing in the seed rounds or whatever. Um, right now we're investing in more like strategic um, yeah. fit with catcher. Yeah. Um, so looking more into med tech and the related fields. Um, but I'm curious, in terms of like operating as a fund, mm -hmm. um, how do you, can you share a bit more about how like NextView operates? How do you organize your team or decision-making and mm -hmm. how do you like grow your team in terms of like their careers um, that keep the team yeah. interesting? Um, got it. Okay. So we can go into like a lot more, but let me stay kind of pretty high level. Um, Thank you. Well, so first of all, uh, there, there are like two types of corporate venture farm. One is balance sheet investment. One is like kind of a separate dedicated fund, right? So this is a traditional venture fund model is probably more analogous to a dedicated separate pool vehicle where, you know, the, the corporate is the end so, so LP or one of the major anchor LPs, right? Because fundamentally like funds are operated on management fees and carry, uh, which impacts a lot of the decision-making flow down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the way we operate is you know, my three partners started the firm a decade ago. So they're the three founders. They've been three GPs for the first three funds. And then they brought me in fund three. Um, and then I became a GP in fund four. So that's kind of the quick evolution of the partnership. We, I would call, we are more of a, you know, two of the best successful funds in the US, Sequoia and Benchmark, 
we're more like a benchmark model, like boutique, small partnership, joint decision making, equal partnership, as opposed to Koya, which is more like a platform empire with all sorts of different vehicles, both very successful. Um, and culturally speaking, we're, we're more aligned with kind of the benchmark approach. Uh, so we're equal partnership. Um, investment decision making, uh, uh, there are two different styles, broadly speaking. One is consensus, one is conviction. Consensus means everybody or majority needs to agree on any investment. Conviction meaning one of the partners need to have a strong conviction and then the other partners can. So like I can make an investment happen if all of my partners hate it. But obviously we have voting process in this throughout the dis discussion. So I know why they hate it. And then we record it, but we don't use the other people don't like it to hold it against it because we're trying to, once an investment is made, it's kind of a fun level investment. So that's kind of how we make investment decisions. Um, and I would say similar to most venture funds, you know, usually every partner has his or her own kind of funnel. So like I take all first meetings, I digest this hospital crazy IOT thing. If it's interesting enough, I raise it on Monday meeting to get some feedback and then they say stuff, maybe have some industry contacts for me to reach out to. So help me a little bit of diligence and I help them. And then I digest, I have to be like wrestling in my head and be like, do I move forward? Do I not? And then I get feedback. Hey, what do you guys think about, you know, $3 million round on 12 pre and how should I like maneuver, you know, get feedback on that. So that's kind of how we do deal process. Um, diligence is mostly run by, led by the partner at C stage is not a whole lot. It's like the team and, you know, diving deeper into the sales pipeline or cohort data, whatever they have. Uh, in terms of growing teams, we're pretty, most, see, most venture firms are pretty top heavy with exceptions of like, you know, folks like Inside, Bessemer, they have more of an army of analysts and associates that are just out like scouting. Um, but I say most other venture firms are pretty top heavy and we're, we're not dissimilar because our belief is that it's very, it's hard. Junior people can be very helpful with sourcing and top of the funnel, meaning finding out what else is going on in the ecosystem, making sure we see enough companies, but they will take time to develop in terms of judgment and winning deals because winning deals mostly needs to take kind of the partner to be like, you want to partner with me because I bring this and that, and that takes years. So, so like, we don't try to staff up the junior team too much. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the time, historically, when we hire junior people, it's not a partner track, meaning they don't have a clear track and which is also not uncommon. Uh, which is why side note that like building a venture career is very tricky. Um, but at the same time, we tell candidates like, look, if we as a firm are growing, who knows what happens after fun five? And maybe we have someone who is kicking ass on the team. And at the time, you know, it might make sense to make that person uh, a serious consideration for a partner track. So we don't really promise that. Uh, and then outside of the investment team, we have a uh, head of platform, which is kind of a grab bag for, uh, you know, portfolio engagement work, in running events for us, brand content. So mm -hmm. she does things around like figuring out where our 10 year anniversary dinner is gonna be with our LPs and founders in New York to like, how do we think about redesigning our website to what's our content strategy? This is all like firm marketing stuff. And yeah. then like, the nitty gritty of like operational stuff. Um, we outsource our, historically we outsource our fund administration. So we have, you know, kind of external uh, for, for funding and SOI. And we finally got a part-time CFO to help us with audits um, and, and, you know, stuff like that. Thanks for sharing, super, super helpful. Great. I think, with, yeah. Yeah. I think with that, we should really wrap the first part of the session and please kind of like, I guess, you know, like I have, I think most of you with the webcam. So I guess that's put our hands together for formality. Really, thank you so much for all this fantastic. Thank share. you for, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you. It was mildly entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, so I think, you know, like before we go into the last part, I want to quickly Share because I know some of you might need to go. I know that you know a couple a couple of you had to step out already, but just very quickly, I want to give another shout out with Sammy and feel free to follow them if you are interested in what they're up to. 
and before we move into the next session, also our next woman in venture, the 12th one and counting is coming up next month. So feel free to uh, check it out. Uh, the RSVP is actually out already if you want to register for that. And thank you, Sammy, again, for also still being our partner. And I guess with that, thank you so much for joining us. And